your Bibles with you this evening. Uh, turn with me to uh, Judges, back to the Old Testament. Judges, uh, we're going to start in chapter 10. Uh, and Lord willing, we're going to go through uh, to at least uh, the beginning of chapter 12. That's the idea tonight. Uh, I know that you think I'm incapable of that, and you may be right. And so we'll find out here shortly. Uh, a large portion of what we're going to be looking at tonight is narrative. And so I'll be doing more reading this evening than perhaps I normally do. I will remind you, I am reading from the ESV, and so uh, that might help you to follow along there, just knowing that. But um, again, probably reading more, try and comment less. I'll, I'll try and keep that to a minimum this evening. And uh, we'll, we'll be looking at a man named Jephthah this evening. And so uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into the Word of God together. Father, I thank you for our time together. Uh, it's, it's just a joy, a joy to be here uh, with my brothers and sisters once again, uh, the privilege it is to worship you, and Lord, for the reminders we have tonight of your, uh, of your grace, uh, Lord, that we once again can say it is well, uh, Lord, all because of Jesus. And Father, we, uh, we thank you for the power of the risen Christ, the power that not only uh, brings forgiveness but cancels sin, a power that gives us a hope that goes far beyond this life. And I, I pray as we come to your word that uh, you would have your way in us once again. Uh, Lord, I know I'm nothing but an unworthy servant, and I pray that you would move and work in spite of me for your glory tonight. You know each heart, you know each need. Lord, uh, nothing is hidden from you, and so we pray that uh, you would uh, encourage uh, your people, that you might strengthen them, that we might be uh, conformed more to the image of Christ, that our love for you might grow and increase. And Lord, uh, make us better servants for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we journeyed together through the book of Judges, we've seen think possible for, for God's people, and yet, God's mercy has been evident through it all. And he's kept his promise repeatedly. Uh, and we're reminded of this covenant relationship that God entered into with the people of Israel. I will be your God and you will be my people. And although the, the people of, of Israel have been very unfaithful in keeping their covenant, God has been absolutely faithful. And the last time we were together, we witnessed the rise and fall of a man named Abimelech. Uh, he was the illegitimate son of Gideon. Uh, he was a self made man. Uh, he, he brought himself into power. It was the first time in the book of Judges we've seen a leader rise to power who the Lord did not call. And that did not work out well. Uh, and, and, and a matter of fact, it was just evidence of a life lived apart from God. And it's a life that leads to destruction. And that's exactly what happened to Abimelech. Uh, he died a disgraceful death at the hands of a woman, and he went down in history in disgrace and dishonor. And, um, you know, we saw some maybe unfamiliar judges, uh, Tola and Jair, who led Israel really un uncommonly, did not deliver them from a foreign enemy, but delivered them from themselves. <laughs> and, 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 lived in peace for about 23 years, and sadly, the pattern that has become all too common is about to repeat itself again here in chapter 10. We see it in verse 6. Uh, you can read along with me. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites, and they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah, and against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. So we see this cycle again, all too familiar. The people of Israel did evil in the sight of 
the Lord. This pattern has played out in that way. And as they do evil in the sight of the Lord, God judges them, delivers them over to a foreign power. They cry out. God raises up a deliverer to rescue and save them. And we've seen that cycle repeat and repeat. But each time, things get worse. And this time, we see actually seven foreign deities are mentioned here in Judges chapter 10 that the people of God, the people who have entered into covenant with Jehovah have said, you will be our God. They're worshiping the foreign gods of the people around them. In fact, these are the very nations that they drove out of the land of Canaan. That God gave them over. That through the, you see those victories in the book of Judges. And they have drove out the Amorites and the, and the Ammonites and the Canaanites. And again and again, all the ites. They, just, they, you know, they, they, they drove them out one after another. And all of their gods, we now find the people of Israel are worshiping. Now that, that doesn't make sense, does it? The God who delivered you out of Egypt, brought you into the promised land, drove out these foreign nations. You have now adopted the practice of worshiping their gods? That seems irrational. And yet it's exactly what we talked about this morning when we talked about how the church was being Corinthianized. Right? The people of God here are being Canaanized. And for many of us, we are being Americanized. Right? And we are worshiping the gods of our land. And so this is not impossible. In fact, this is what we see, this pattern happening over and over again among the people of God. And it's happening today. And so how do the people respond in this time of oppression? Because God, in His anger, and yes, God does get angry, rightly so, delivers them over. It actually says he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites. This really sets the stage for our next couple of judges. Uh, we'll look at, focus on the Ammonites tonight, and then the next time we'll be looking at the Philistines and a man named Samson, who you're probably more familiar with. But God delivers them, sells them. Roman says, gave them up, right? God basically says, you want their foreign gods? You can have them. And after 18 years of oppression, the people have had enough. And in verse 10, it says, The people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. We see a picture of repentance, right? Lord, we have sinned against you. But notice the response of the Lord here. The Lord said to the people of Israel, Did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the Ammonites and from the Philistines? The Sidonians also, the Amalekites and the Manites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will save you no more. Go, cry out to the gods whom you have chosen let them save you in the time of your distress. This is not the response we've seen so far. We've seen the people cry out to God, and God has responded by raising up a deliverer. But here, he says, I will save you no more. You want deliverance? You want rescue? Go to your gods. Right. Now, what we see here is that Israel is not responding in genuine repentance in verse 10. What do, they, what do they want? They want, they want something. <laughs> and so this is not a matter of, God, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. This is a matter of, God, we're in a mess and I want you to get us out. There's a difference, is there not? There's, there's a difference between genuine repentance and worldly sorrow. And, and I believe what we see here, in fact, sometimes I think it's, it's easier to talk about what repentance is not, to give you a good picture. Um... Repentance is not merely confession. They say, I've sinned against you, God, and they had. They, 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 had, they were worshiping false gods and false idols. They had said, I will have no other gods before you. But yet there they were, worshiping these false gods. But confession is more than merely saying, I did this and I'm sorry. It's a turning away from, that's what repentance truly is, a turning away from sin. And here they're not turning away from it. They're just simply saying, this is what I did. You know, worldly sorrow, it, it, it's, you feel bad? 
but there's no change. Usually you feel bad because you got caught, right? That's worldly sorrow. That's really the situation that Israel's in now. The circumstances of their, of their sin has led them to a place where they are overwhelmed. And so they call out to the Lord, get me out of this mess that I've got myself in. That's worldly sorrow. There's no sorrow over sin. Um, this is what I call vending machine repentance, right? God, I want something, and so this is the button I push, and if I push this button, then you give me what I want. Right? This is what we see with the, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel today. <laughs> God, I will do this, and you must do this. That's not repentance. <laughs> that's that's a, a genie, right? I mean, that's something else altogether. Yeah, you know, sometimes we just make excuses. Yeah, this is just the way I am. So, yeah, that, none of that is genuine repentance. Genuine repentance, we actually see in verse 15, after God says, you want, you want deliverance? Go to those other gods. And in verse 15, what do we see? The people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned, do to us whatever seems good to you. Lord, I'm in your hands. Whatever we deserve, I'll take, I'll take the consequences, right? This is, this is genuine sorrow over sin here. There's a difference. There's a distinction. There's a turning away from, Lord, we are coming back to you. And, and even as they make that request, they say, please deliver us this day. Lord, rescue us. You know, the oppression is overwhelming. So... Here's the repentance, right? They put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. <laughs> That's repentance. There's a turning away from the idolatry, from the sin, and a turning back to the Lord. There's a visible picture there. Sometimes we play around with sin, do we not? We, we play games with our sin. Yes, I did it, I'm sorry, and then you do it again. And yes, I did it, I'm sorry, and I do it again. That's not repentance. That's a game. <laughs> Genuine repentance is, Lord, I'm sorry. And I want to put this away. I hate this. Now, that doesn't mean you don't fall and you don't struggle. You know, we're in a battle with sin. And sometimes we fail. But when we fail, we run back to the Lord. So we see the people of Israel repent and turn back to the Lord. And it says the Lord became impatient over the misery of Israel. Now, your, your KJV says he was grieved for the misery, the misery of Israel. But it literally means he was short. <laughs> it, he, he became short. And, and, and what he's going to do is he's going to cut short their misery. He looks at their condition and he says, no more. Now this is nothing short of the mercy of God. <laughs> Israel deserves everything they're getting and then some. <laughs> I, are you not frustrated at this point in the book of Judges? I, 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 by the time you get here, you're just thinking, God, wipe them out. Start over. Aren't you thankful that he doesn't? Because he'd have to do it with us. Because we're such a mess, and we, we do the same things, but we read it, and it's so frustrating to us. How could they turn again to these foreign gods and these foreign idols? And we see the mercy of God and the compassion as he moves on behalf of his people. It says, then the Ammonites were called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead. And the people of Israel came together, and they encamped at Mizpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is this man, or who is the man, who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So the people have returned to the Lord in repentance. They've gathered together. They're ready for deliverance. But there's no leader. There's no judge. There's no deliverer that has been raised up. And they're going, who's going to lead us? And so we're introduced to this man named Jephthah in chapter 11. Now, within Jephthah's rise to power, you, you truly see a man, you, you've heard the story, right? From zero to hero, right? The rags to, this is, this is Jephthah. Uh, notice verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 1. Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. Oh. We'll see that come to fruition. But he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And 
when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows corrected, collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Now Jephthah's story, his background is pretty tough. He has no control over what he is born into. He was born into a broken home. His mother was a prostitute, but his dad took him in, and he was in the home with all of these other half-brothers, and he was despised. Uh, he was, uh, you know, after his dad had died, his brothers drove him out, said, there's no way you're getting any part of this inheritance. And he had to flee, and he had to run to another land. And essentially, um, essentially Jephthah becomes a, a mob boss, <laughs> a gang leader. That's what we see here. Uh, he's he's going to gather men around him, and he's going to become a, a plunder, <laughs> yeah, whatever you want to call it. This is, this is his character. This is who he is. He's taking care. In, in fact, the story sounds eerily similar to what we just saw with Abimelech. The man who, the self-made man who brought himself to power. He was the illegitimate son of, of Gideon. Here we have the illegitimate son of Gilead. But God has his hand on Jephthah. And it's encouraging to us to, to see a man whose who's beginning and whose prospects are so dismal. It seems like he has no hope. It seems like he has no future. And yet, we know that God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world, right? And so here's this man who really has nothing, but God's hand is upon him. And we'll see that as we continue. Since after a time, we're kind of brought back into the reality here. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to Jephthah, Come be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you're in distress? <laughs> Sounds very familiar to the way God responded to them in chapter 10. <laughs> Why are you coming to me now? Because we need help. The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, This is why we've turned to you, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. And despite all of his faults, the thing we see about Jephthah is he mentions the Lord more than any other judge. He, he has a relationship with Jehovah God. Now, there's some issues that we'll, we'll come across as we move forward, but... He believes in the Lord. In fact, this is a man who's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 in the hall of faith for his, for his belief in Jehovah. God's going to use him. And so what we'll see is it, this is a man, a mighty warrior, and he, he knows the cost of battle. And so Jephthah's first act is not war. <laughs> in fact, his first act is diplomacy. He, he goes to the pen before the sword. Uh, we'll, we'll start with verse 12 here in chapter 11. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said, What do you have against me that you have come to me to fight against my land? The king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel, on coming up from Egypt, took away my land, from the Arnon to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now therefore restore it peaceably. Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said to him. Now really, what Jephthah's going to do is he's going he's to use three arguments here to defend why this land is Israel's and not the Ammonites. Uh, number one, he's going he's to look to history, and he's going to look to theology, and then he's going to look at legal precedent. All right? And so that's the, the flow of the argument here. Number one, history. We see it in um, verse 15. Thus said Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, 
But when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. And they sent also to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. Then they journeyed through the wilderness and went around to the land of Edom and the land of Moab and arrived on the east side of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. Israel then sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon, and and Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land to our country. But Sion did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sion gathered all his people together and camped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. And they took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. He gives them a history lesson. He says, this is not your land and we didn't didn't just take it or steal it. Sion attacked us and we defeated him. And as such, this is our land. And it was never your land to begin with, the land of the Amorites, right? I know it's confusing sometimes, Ammonites, Amorites. Right, different people. Right, so this is he's saying this is not your land to begin with, and then he goes to from a theological standpoint in verse twenty three. So then the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and are you to take possession of them? Will you not possess what Chemosh your God gives you to possess? And all the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess. Now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zephyr, king of Moab? So, what he's saying is simply this. God gave us this land. If your false god gave you land, you would take it. And so, he's saying, are you going to try and go up against Jehovah God? That's essentially what he's saying. Jehovah gave us this land, and it belongs to us. And then, from a legal standpoint, we saw in verse 25, Are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel, or did he ever go to war with them? It was originally Moab's land, remember? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages, and in Aor and its villages, and all the cities are on the banks of the Arnon, 300 years, why did you not deliver them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. Simply, he's just saying this. For 300 years we've had this land, and nobody's, nobody's contended that it didn't belong to us. So why are you coming now? <laughs> Good argument. Historical, theological, legal precedent. Verse 28, the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. War was inevitable. And that's what's going to happen. Now in verse 29, we really see the key to victory here. Then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. And he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. So battle's coming, and we have seen this pattern, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon the servant of God. Now, when that happens, we have seen victory is certain, right? And so at this point, we know what's going to happen. Now, A striking contrast happens here because when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jephthah and they're getting ready to go into battle, at this point he should know victory is ours. But he doubts. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now we're going to come back to that. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from the Aor to the neighborhood of Mineth, 20 cities, and as far as abel Karamim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Well, we see victory, right? God used Jephthah to deliver the people of Israel from the Ammonite oppression. 18 years of brutal oppression. Victory. Deliverance. Now, this is the moment where you're going, right? Happy ending. (laughs) 
Right? This, is, this, is, this is kind of what we come to expect. Unfortunately, that's not the kind of story we have. It, it, it's one of the things I love about the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't, it, it doesn't sugarcoat things. It just, it just puts people before us, right? The way they are and, and the way things happen. And then I think in many ways, that's one of the reasons why we can be certain of the validity, uh, validity of the Bible. You know, what we're going to see is, is not what you expect to happen in a fairy tale. <laughs> this is what happened. Don't forget the vow that he made, right? You give victory into my hand, whatever comes to the doors of my house to me, when I return in peace, shall be the Lord's, and I'll offer it up for a burnt offering. So we come to verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. <laughs> She's celebrating. Daddy, <laughs> we won. It's a victory. What do you think is going through his mind? The vow that he made. How foolish. How foolish. Now people try and people try and justify what Jephthah did. They, they, this is a spirit filled man, a man led by God. Surely he was not doing a wicked thing. Where did this come from? It was not uncommon at all for, for, for leaders to make a vow before going into battle. But to to offer up a sacrifice, a human sacrifice. That was foreign to the people of God. You know who it wasn't foreign to? The Ammonites. They had a god, a false god named Molech. And they frequently offered up child sacrifices to Molech. In fact, before they would go into battle, they would say, Molech, give us victory. And before the battle would start, they would offer up child sacrifice and what we see is exactly what we've been talking about. Adopting the practices of the culture around us. We see a man who says, I can't let them outdo us. To guarantee victory, I must offer a great sacrifice. And so, Lord, whatever comes out of my door, the very first one, and it's not talking about an animal, the verb here, you know, it, it, or the ten, it's, it's talking about a, a, a person. Whatever person comes out the door, I will offer up as a burnt offering. Now this goes against the very law of God. We see it in, in Deuteronomy. We see it in Leviticus. God had forbid human sacrifice. But Jephthah spoke foolishly. And in fact, we see in verse 35, as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. <laughs> it just hits home. Now, again, some commentators have said Jephthah wasn't offering up a, a, a sacrifice, a human sacrifice. He was simply offering her to the Lord to, for service. If he was simply offering her to the Lord for service, I don't believe he's tearing his robe at this moment. I don't believe he's breaking down at this moment. He knew exactly what he meant. I don't think there's a question here as we read. And he says, I cannot take back my vow. Now, here's the thing, right? <laughs> Very foolish for him to do this, but it is sin once again to follow through. He says, I cannot take it back. Had he went to the priest, the priest would have said, pay the price of redemption. <laughs> he says, I cannot take my, back my vow. And his daughter's response is incredible here. She said, my father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what is going out of your mouth. Now the Lord has avenged you of your enemies on the, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. 
Leave me alone two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, Go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. You don't mourn someone who was offered up for service. You lament and mourn someone who died. <laughs> when I go back to, to verse 35, he says, I have opened my mouth. Many times that's our problem, isn't it? We speak <laughs> without thinking. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. How true that is in this instance. Not long ago, we looked at James chapter 3 as we walked through that book and just saw the power of our words. It is a warning for us tonight that we need to guard our mouth, that we need to guard our tongue. We can speak quickly, rashly, foolishly, and it can be costly. And Jeff is an example of that for us this evening. May we be, as David says, set a watch over my lips, O Lord. Well, unfortunately, the, the downward spiral is not complete. As we come to chapter 12, it says, The men of Ephraim were called to arms. And they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? That sounds familiar, right? Same thing they said to Gideon. <laughs> Why did you, they, they want the glory, right? They want part of the battle. But here, notice, he says, we will burn your house over you with fire. They never said that before. They threatened his very life. Because he did, they didn't, he said, they didn't give him opportunity to win the victory. But notice Jephthah's response. Jephthah said, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. He does give credit to Jehovah here. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? He says, I gave you opportunity. We don't have record of that. I gave you opportunity, and you didn't come. So why are you here now? Now Gideon had responded softly to the Ephraimites, and they were satisfied. Jephthah's response is not so soft. And Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to them, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said no, they said to him, Then say Shibboleth. And he said, Zibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Now, <laughs> this is civil war. Right? We, we see conflict taking place among the people of God. 42,000 of God's people are going to die. Now, you read that, and it's almost humorous the way they, right? I mean, but you, you see the division among God's people. There's, there's cultural divisions to the point now where they don't even speak same. You know, they, they, they speak differently. And they, so the Ephraimites can't pronounce Shibboleth, and they say it's Sibboleth, but they're able to distinguish them apart, and in doing so, they kill them. Sadly, we see this again among the people many times the people of God are harder on the people of God than anyone else. Sadly, sometimes the greatest opposition that you face is among brothers and sisters in Christ. And here we see, we see the leadership of Jephthah fall to a, a new low as he kills his own people. 
And then in verse 7, it says, Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. You know, if there's no... Typically, as, it, as we read, Jephthah judged Israel. It says peace was throughout the land for... But there was no peace. There was, there was no peace under the leadership of Jephthah. They had been delivered from the Ammonites, but conflict still existed among themselves. And it's a sad picture as the people of God continue to spiral downward. I thought about this, just, you know, even, even this imperfect man, you know, Jephthah the judge, even in him we have a picture of, we have a picture of the perfect deliverer. Jephthah was an imperfect deliverer. He was, he was a man who was rejected by his own people. They did not receive him, and yet he was raised up to deliver them. That sounds like a familiar story, does it not? Jesus Christ came to his own, and his own received him not. He was an outcast, rejected, and yet he loved them, he served them, he died for them. The same is true for us. We, we did not seek Him. We did not love Him, according to Romans. You know, we love Him, why? Because He first loved us. Jesus set His love on us when we did not care for Him, when we rejected Him. And so we have this picture, even in Jephthah, of one that God would use to be the ultimate deliverer, the ultimate savior. Uh, I would say this, you know, in response to that salvation, what is God looking for? Not a, not a human sacrifice, a living sacrifice, right? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's what God wants in response to his redemption, in response to his deliverance, not a foolish vow, not a, a physical death, but a, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so that's the picture we have for us as a people of God tonight. Yes, we have been delivered, we have been rescued by one who we rejected, and in response to his grace and mercy, we have been called to die, yes, die to ourselves and live to him. Uh, there's much application for us tonight. Our time is out. I made it, right? I made it through chapter 12, so that's probably a first. All right. Let's close in prayer.